and the Oscar goes to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Hello again, children, and welcome back to what will hopefully be my very last Pinocchio video. So a few months back, I made a video ranking 27 different Pinocchio film adaptations, and it did quite well. It got lots of nice comments from people in different countries, and lots of requests for me to try the same format with other fairy tales, which I definitely intend to do in the future. But there was one particular Pinocchio film that was missing from the list, and many of my commenters took issue with its absence, calling it a masterpiece and saying that I can't consider myself a Pinocchio authority until I've reviewed it. I'm referring, of course, to the 1972 Pinocchio by Luigi Comancini. Pinocchio. Man, did my Italian subscribers let me have it for leaving that one out. I got so many comments about how I needed to drop everything I was doing and go watch it, so I looked for it online, but I couldn't find a good subtitled version. So I bought a DVD from a sketchy website, but it never showed up. But then two months later, it did show up, but it still didn't have subtitles. So finally, I gave up and made a video about the Del Toro film instead. Guillermo del Toro first announced plans for a Pinocchio adaptation all the way back in 2008, but it spent over a decade in development hell before he was able to get the funding he needed to finish it. When it finally was released, it happened to fall in the middle of a minor Pinocchio renaissance, which we're still going through, with three Pinocchio films just last year, another one this year, a video game, and a weird cameo in that show you all love. <laughs> But Del Toro's film managed to rise above the crowd, with many naming it not only the best Pinocchio of 2022, but the greatest Pinocchio adaptation of all time. Now everyone except me already made videos about this film when it came out back in December, but people seem especially interested in my opinion since I am after all the guy who's seen 27 different Pinocchios. Not to be confused with the guy who's seen 31 different Pinocchios. And sure, I could have just posted something saying that I too think it's great, that it deserves all the hype it's getting, and that Del Toro is the world's most adorable genius and I hope he lives forever. We we'll use this small Pinocchio. <laughs> but that didn't seem like enough. See, people don't just like Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, they love it. They really love it. And some have gone as far as to say that it's the only good Pinocchio and that its mere existence means we can throw out all the others. And that bothers me, because out of the 27 Pinocchios I watched, I thought most of them were pretty good and seven of them were genuinely great. So after hearing take after take about how Del Toro's the first person who's ever gotten the story right and how much smarter and darker his film is than all the rest, I felt like it was my duty as an almost Pinocchio completist to put it under the microscope and see if it really is the best adaptation of Carlo Collati's story. So here's how we're gonna do it. My current Pinocchio champion is the original Disney film, so that's gonna be the one to beat. I've come up with six scientific categories, we're gonna compare both films in each round, give a point to the winner, and at the end we'll let the numbers decide which Pinocchio truly wears the little wooden crown. So no more delays, let the battle begin. Round one, animation. animation is probably the best thing about either of these films. Del Toro's contains some of the richest and most beautiful stop-motion animation I've ever seen, but Disney's contains some of the richest and most beautiful cell animation I've ever seen, which is a much wider field. Now Del Toro's is clearly a labor of love. You can really see the amount of time and effort that went into every last frame. The landscapes are gorgeous, the shots are beautifully composed, and everything on screen has been painstakingly constructed one tiny little groove at a time. It's a wonder to behold, and I can't think of another stop-motion film with anywhere near this level of detail. That said, I'm not sure stop motion necessarily benefits from more detail. I think that's kind of the opposite of what it's supposed to do. For me, the main appeal of stop motion is that it invokes a sense of play. It's handmade. It's interactive. You want to reach in and touch everything for yourself. <laughs> So in this sense, I think the format kind of works best when it's done on a smaller, cheaper scale, which is probably why all the most famous stop-motion films were made for television. When you watch Rudolph, you're looking into a small world from above. When you watch Pinocchio, you're looking out at a huge world from within. Both of these styles work, but it's only the first that makes you feel like you're part of the creative experience in a way no other art form can. So I'd argue that the main reason Del Toro's film looks so great isn't because of the unique appeal of stop-motion, but rather just because it looks like a Del Toro film. He always has beautiful lighting and camera work, and a lot of the shots people have praised the most are ones that would probably look just as good in live action. Again, that's not a problem, it's just not maximizing the medium. Disney's Pinocchio, on the other hand, is maximizing what cell animation can do. It's so breathtaking and immersive in every scene, so packed with magic tricks that your eyes can't keep up. 
The multiplane shots pull you into the film and make it feel completely three-dimensional. The Gustav Tengren backgrounds have an old-world charm that would define many Disney movies to come, and every frame is filled with as many moving pieces as possible, so no matter how many times you rewatch the film, there's always something new to discover. You can just feel the energy of the animators pushing each other into impossible new places, and I doubt we'll ever see anything quite like it again. So round one goes to Disney. I made a flesh and bone and meaty bits! I'm a real boy! This one's a no-brainer. So from the beginning, the biggest problem with making a Pinocchio film is how to design Pinocchio himself. How do you bring life to a character whose defining characteristic is that he's lifeless? Disney did a pretty good job with their version, they made him work, but he's mostly just a regular human with puppet joints, and with a little bit of Mickey Mouse thrown in. But Del Toro's? I mean, come on, this is just phenomenal. Good morning, Papa! They say a good character design is one you can recognize just by its silhouette. It's Pikachu! It's and in that regard, I don't think any other Pinocchio even comes close to this one. This is instantly iconic. He's based on pre-existing illustrations by Grizz Grimley, but he really takes on a new life here. I love his spindly spider body, his big joker smile, the loose nails, the unfinished wood, whatever's going on on the back of his head. He's creepy when he needs to be, he's cute when he needs to be, absolutely perfect, 10 out of 10, no notes. I'm not as big a fan of the rest of the characters in the film. The humans are a little uncanny, especially the children. Some of them look like they'd be more at home in Pinocchio 3000. Also, I'm really bummed that the fox and the cat got cut. Or, not really cut, but they combined the fox and the puppet master into a hybrid character and then replaced the cat with a monkey. Which is okay, I just feel like we've seen a lot of stop-motion monkeys lately and they're all kind of boring. Grimly's fox and cat are really cool looking and I don't know why they didn't try to do something with these designs instead. Actually, the Disney remake came a lot closer to Grimly here than Del Toro did. Now, as far as the original Disney film goes, it definitely has the stronger supporting cast. A lot of my all-time favorite Disney characters come from that film. But just on the strength of Pinocchio himself, I think this is still a pretty clear choice. Round two goes to Del Toro. I want to tell you a story. It's a story you may think you know, but <laughs> you don't. The thing that surprised me most about Del Toro's film is that it's actually a pretty faithful adaptation. I'd heard people describe it as a completely different story, and yeah, there are thematic differences, but in terms of plot, almost everything here is taken from either Kaladi or Disney. The only major change is to the setting, and if you think setting a classic story in a new time period makes it a radical reinterpretation, I encourage you to check out any high school Shakespeare production. Wow. But the new setting does work really well. It takes place in fascist Italy in the lead up to the Second World War, which brings a whole different sense of weight to the story. Not everything gels perfectly, it gets a little muddied in places, but overall it's a much smoother narrative than Disney's. The book is just a series of morality plays, it's very episodic, and Disney's adaptation clearly struggled to come up with natural scene transitions. Uh, he was swallowed by a whale. Swallowed by a whale? Del Toro's covers this up with an ingenious little plot device. In this version, Pinocchio can't die. <laughs> Oh, hi, it's me! If he dies in the real world, he goes to a spirit realm where he's resurrected, but it takes longer and longer each time, so whenever Del Toro needs to introduce a new set piece, he can just kill Pinocchio and have him wake up in the next chapter. It makes for a much more coherent plot and creates a looming sense of danger, even though Pinocchio is technically immoral. Also, I love that they included the rabbit pallbearers here. Who's that? I thought he was dead. He is dead. I saw the paperwork myself. There's a great scene with them in the book that usually gets cut from the film adaptations, so I was really glad to see them again, and this was a super cute way to work them in. Otherwise, I think both stories function pretty similarly. We'll get into the specific differences a little later, but for now, round three, Del Toro. I was actually a little disappointed in the music for Del Toro's film. The soundtrack has gotten a ton of praise, and yeah, it's good, I just don't think there's anything that remarkable about it. It sounds pretty similar to a lot of other Del Toro films. Lots of pretty little light motifs that go up about half a scale and then back down for a note or two and then do the same thing again but different. Okay, I'm not a music guy, but I'll show you what I mean. Okay, that one's a little different, but you get what I'm trying to say, right? No! I also don't think it really even needed to be a musical. The songs are all pretty, but again, they all sound kind of the same. 
just wistful, melancholy, not too fast, not too slow, wandering around looking for a melody they never find. They build the atmosphere, but beyond that they don't add much, and I also feel like we've seen them all done before in other versions of this story. We get the song where the puppet master wants to reclaim his glory days, just like in Geppetto, the song where Pinocchio comes to life and asks what everything's called, just like with Sandy Duncan, the sad Geppetto lullaby at the beginning, the uplifting dance number by the cricket, three different songs that Pinocchio sings on stage. I'm not saying Del Toro deliberately copied any of these other songs, I'm just saying they're all very obvious choices and none of them feel specific to this version of the story. I mean, I guess I've never seen another version where Pinocchio sings about Mussolini pooping himself, but I have seen three Russian versions where metaphorical dictators metaphorically poop themselves, so I wasn't that impressed. Music! Professor. Disney's Pinocchio probably isn't the first film that comes to mind when you think of great Disney musicals. There aren't any real showstopper songs apart from When You Wish Upon a Star, and to be honest I've never been crazy about Give a Little Whistle, but I do think it's one of Disney's most underrated scores. The music has a ton of personality, every piece has a completely different feel, and the songs are all worked into the score in really interesting ways. I didn't realize how much I loved this music until I listened to a Disney tribute album from the 80s called Stay Awake, which I'd highly recommend. It remixes a bunch of older Disney Disney songs to bring out their darker qualities, and every time a piece from Pinocchio came up it sent a chill down my spine. I went back and listened to the original score afterwards and realized there's a very creepy undercurrent that plays all throughout the film, so even the happiest scenes are cluing you into the much more sinister forces in play. I do like both of these scores, I just think there's a lot more going on in Disney's, so I'm gonna throw them another point here. Kate Blanchett and I were having such a good time that she said, you gotta give me a part on Pinocchio. I said, the only part left is a monkey. This is hardly an original take, but I still gotta say it, I am not a fan of celebrity voice casts. Voice acting and screen acting are very different crafts that require very different skill sets, and yet the most talented voice actors almost never get to headline major films. Instead, half the budget goes to big stars who either play themselves or put on a generic silly voice that a trained voice actor could have done twice as well for a fraction of the pay. And sure, some A-listers happen to be good voice actors, in the same way that some A-listers happen to be good SNL hosts. Oh, good for mine. But they're few and far between, and they're never going to be better than the people who do it full time. So when I see a film advertised with a cast list like this, it just kind of makes my eyes roll. All these performers are fine, they do a serviceable job, but do we really need this cast to sell this film? Did anyone watch a trailer for a creepy Pinocchio adaptation by the guy who made Devil's Backbone and think, oh look, a new Finn Wolfhard movie? I just don't get it. Like, Kate Blanchett makes surprisingly good monkey noises, but is she the best monkey noise maker in the business? No, she's not. Also, unpopular opinion, but I'm getting a little tired of Tilda Swinton getting cast as twin sisters in the same film and then playing both parts almost exactly the same. Like, I love me some Tilda, but she's supposed to be a chameleon. Why are we letting her get away with this? The sentimental fool. I don't know, it is what it is, but I obviously prefer Disney here. You look at any older Disney film and the voices are inseparable from the characters, and Pinocchio has some real Hall of Fame performances. Cliff Edwards brings a warmth to Jiminy Cricket that instantly made him into one of the studio's trademark characters. I'll bet a lot of you folks don't believe that. Charles Judels pulls double duty as both Stromboli and the Coachman, but you'd never know it was the same actor, unlike with some people. So you can talk. That's a me too. Christian Rubb. Well, Christian Rubb was a Nazi sympathizer, so no love for him, but his Geppetto is the only one that's ever captured the underlying insanity of the character. Geppetto makes some pretty dumb decisions in this story. It doesn't really work if you just play him as a kindly old man who means well. You also need to show that he's a bit of a nut job, and this version absolutely nails it. You're dead, Pinocchio. No! No, I'm not! Yes. Yes, you are. Don't lie down. But father! There's really no contest here. Across the board, this is an entirely different league of voice talent. Point Disney. I wanted to do a movie about uh, a world where everybody behaves like a puppet except the puppet. This one's a little harder to pin down. So one thing a lot of people have praised about Del Toro's film is how much darker it is than other versions, but I don't think those people have actually seen very many Pinocchio films because they're all pretty messed up. 
We've had a slasher Pinocchio, a creepy anime Pinocchio, a depressing sci-fi Pinocchio, a creepy anime slash depressing sci-fi Pinocchio, not to mention this, 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 and of course this. <laughs> But despite all of that, I would still contend that Disney's Pinocchio has always been the darkest version, and that's still true when you compare it to Del Toro's. In Disney's film, none of the villains are punished, but in Del Toro's, every villain either dies or gets a redemption arc. Both films use the visual language of a horror movie, but Del Toro's does it as an homage, whereas Disney's does it simply to make the scene as scary as possible. And while Del Toro's film is set in the pre-war 1930s, where bombs fly overhead and young boys are sent off to be soldiers as soon as they can carry a gun, Disney's film was made made in the 1930s, when young boys actually were being recruited for war and no one in the audience would have missed the metaphor. See, a lot of the themes in Del Toro's film are also very present in Disney's, they're just not explicitly laid out in the dialogue like they are here. You take religion. Why do they like him? And not me. Disney's Pinocchio is full of Christian themes and imagery. You've got a character born of a virgin birth, heralded by an angel. His father is a carpenter, whose name, Geppetto, is a nickname for Giuseppe, the Italian for Joseph. He goes through a series of trials and temptations. He descends into a sort of hell, where demons cart off wicked souls to an eternity of suffering. And ultimately, he sacrifices his physical body so he can be resurrected in his true form. But it's not entirely a one-to-one -one allegory. Pinocchio dies only for his own sins, not for others, and he fails almost every trial he faces, so he doesn't really line up as a Christ figure. He could just as easily represent Peter, or Jonah, or the prodigal son, and there's equal evidence to support any of those interpretations. So instead of simply saying, Pinocchio is similar to blank because blank and therefore blank, the film evokes the weight and symbolism of a religious story while allowing the viewer to choose the meaning that resonates most with them, and the film presents its political, social, and mythological ideas in the same way. The coachman could be Satan, or Hitler, or a child trafficker, or just a really bad dude. And if any one of those interpretations doesn't appeal to you, there are plenty of others to choose from. But if you've got a film where Pinocchio openly compares himself to Christ, and then literally winds up tied to a cross at the end, there's just not much room for the audience to bring anything of their own to the story. Basically, this is just a long-winded way of saying that Del Toro lacks subtlety. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel! That makes me feel angry! Nowadays, adults tend to think of fairy tales as happy little stories meant to teach children how the world works, which is why we're always surprised when we go back to read them and discover how random and violent they are. In actuality, fairy tales serve the opposite purpose. They teach kids that there are things out there too horrible to comprehend and levels of evil that can't be explained through any logical story. Most children aren't going to get why a character like this is scary. They don't have the historical context or life experience to wrap their heads around a concept like fascism, no matter how well you explain it to them. Them. But if you show them a creepy demon man who kidnaps boys and turns them into donkeys for his own sick pleasure, suddenly they're a little better prepared to understand just how bad the world can be. And in this way, Disney's film has far more potential to terrify than Del Toro's, despite being aimed at a younger audience. Now as far as what Del Toro's film actually has to say, I like most of it, though I could have done without the whole who is the monster and who is the man theme again. <laughs> We've seen this in almost every Del Toro film, and I don't think it works for this story. Pinocchio, as a character, has never struggled with acceptance. If anything, he's always been pretty popular. His entire narrative is driven by characters recognizing his value, or at least what value he has to them. So it rings a little false to have the masses calling him a witch in one scene and then throwing him money in the next with seemingly no change of heart in between. But it does allow Del Toro to work in his other favorite theme, the value of disobedience, and that's where the film really proves its worth. But I don't want to obey! Part of Pinocchio's journey is learning to decide for himself between right and wrong, but Disney's Pinocchio never really gets to do that. He mostly just learns to do whatever his elders tell him or he'll die. But blind obedience isn't the only step to growing up, you also need to learn why things are the way they are. And if the rules support a status quo that brings with it more harm than good, then you do have a duty to question them, and sometimes even to break them. Del Toro's films often advocate disobedience as a means to challenge an unjust system especially if that system is fascism, as in Pinocchio's two companion films, Pan's Labyrinth and Devil's Backbone. Lots of YouTubers have talked about the disobedience connection already, so I won't dwell on it. Daniel Goldhorn has excellent videos on both of these films, which I'll link in the description if you want to hear more. But what makes it feel fresh in Pinocchio is the way it positions the film as a companion piece to Disney's, and to any other version of the story where Pinocchio becomes real simply by learning to do as he's told. Certainly, it says, you should obey your father. Certainly, you should go to school. 
Certainly, you should be the best little boy you can be until you're old enough to go out into the world on your own. But what then? What if the world you find isn't as perfect as you were led to believe? Should you really keep following the rules, doing only as you're told, trusting whoever's in charge to pull the strings and assuming they alone know best? Does that make you a real boy? Or does it make you a puppet? So I'm not giving either film a point for this round, because I don't think either is really complete without the other. We need a Pinocchio who teaches us how to behave, and one who teaches us when not to. And that's what I like best about Del Toro's film. It never feels like it's trying to outdo Disney's, it just wants to be in conversation with it. Del Toro loves Disney's Pinocchio, he's said so many times, and as much as people like me might enjoy pitting these two films against each other, the truth is that they're stronger together, and I'm really glad we have both. Did you fall in love with it from the Disney cartoon? Yeah, yeah, I saw it with my mom. It was the second or third movie I saw with my mom, and I felt that was the only movie at that age that captured how horrible childhood felt. <laughs> so could it be that there's room at the top for two Pinocchios? A joint first place for the boy who follows the rules and the one who breaks them? Would that water down my praise, or would it only deepen my affection? Maybe I never should have ranked any Pinocchios. Maybe they all deserve to be judged only on their own terms and not based on how they live up to someone else's expectations. All my life, Father. I'm just trying to please you. But I never will. So what do we say? Can we throw out all the points and just have two winners? Nah. Sorry. I still like Disney's more. A lot more, actually. To be honest, it's not even really that close. You are no son of mine! <laughs> <laughs> My initial Pinocchio ranking looked like this. I put the three Russian versions together to keep things simple, but if I'm ranking them separately, the top seven spots would look more like this. And if we add Del Toro's film into that mix, I think it would look like this. Now that's still a pretty honorable position, and if you're wondering how I could possibly like it less than a film with a 0% Rotten Tomatoes score, let me remind you that that film is amazing. It's Tangerine! The truth is I've never been one of those people who thinks that ranking art somehow takes away from its value. I love ranking movies, I think it's a jolly good time, and I'm gonna keep doing it as long as people keep watching. I teased the idea of a Snow White ranking at the end of my last video, and people seemed really excited about that, so I figure we'll try that one next. But I'm not gonna rush it. There's a Disney remake coming out next year, so that'll be the perfect time to put it out, keep things relevant, ride the algorithm, capitalize on all that Disney princess love. Most importantly though, it gives me plenty of time to watch all the films, so I don't have to stress. I can just sit back, relax, and then next March when the remake comes out, I'll... Uh, um... Uh, next March, when the remake comes out, I'll... What? Huh. Oh. Uh-huh. I, um... I should probably get back to work. 